Welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities, the Argonne Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I'll be the host for today's webinar, Good Practices for Research Software Documentation. The webinar will be presented by Stefan Duscat from the German Aerospace Center and Sorel Harriet, Leeds Trinity University. So they will be joining us from two countries in Europe. Uh, Stefan has research software engineering linguistics at the Friedrich Schiller University, Gina. I hope I got it right. And is pursuing a PhD in computers at the German Aerospace Center and Humboldt University in Berlin. He has been a special collaborator of the Software Sustainability Institute, SSSI, since 2018. And uh, he does research on the interface between software citation, software sustainability. Sorel is a lecturer, uh, leads Trinity University, and she leads the uh, undergraduate computer science program there. She was awarded the Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship in 2019. And she has been uh, carrying out research exploring software development processes and organization structures in the academic research context. She is interested in the applicability of social, uh, social technical systems theory to the academic research context. We have issued uh, more than 280 tickets for this uh, webinar. Let's see how many folks are going to actually show up. And all attendees have been muted. We'll be uh, receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I have already pasted them in the, in the chat, but I'll do it again. Uh, and the webinar will have breaks so the speakers can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, with that, uh, I'll stop my sharing here, Stefan, and do take over, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the introduction, Osni. I'm trying to find the correct desktop just now. And you should now all be able to see the first slide. Yes, thank you again for the introduction and thanks also for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, to give you a bit of context, this talk is partially based on the outcome of a discussion session we had at the Software Sustainability Institute's Collaborations Workshop in 2019. And therefore we would also like to thank our co-authors on a blog post we issued as an outcome of this discussion group. What we hope you'll be able to take away from this talk is that you understand the importance of software documentation, especially in research, but also that you know about some of the aspects of research software documentation. And also that you can hopefully be able to make uh, informed choices out of this talk about how to approach documentation in your own software projects. And finally, and this is what Sora will take over later on, is that hopefully you'll be able to make the connection between your software process and the de development process and documentation. And I'd like to start with a fairly high level motivation for well-documented resource software. Um, I'll argue that documentation is important for the software itself, as you will probably be aware, but also for the research that is done with the software. So the first point may be clearer than the second. Um, well-documented software is easier to use than badly documented software. And that's true both for the end users of the software, but also for developers, including yourself, so the original developer or developers in your team. Well-documented software also has a higher potential to endure over time, which we like to call sustainability. And that also means that it can avoid software collapse as it will be easier to pick up the software later on and continue to use or develop it. And I'd like to argue that this results in an importance of documentation for research itself. So, Understandable and easy to use software can better be employed to utilize or extract knowledge, otherwise known as conducting research. But it can also be transferred more easily to other domains or to other research contexts, and therefore can help to expand research knowledge as well. And finally, it has the potential to provide credit to software developers and maintainers, which is something I work in, in my PhD, especially through citation. Uh, you know, If the way to cite a software package is clearly documented, then it's much more likely that you'll be cited as an originator of the software. And this will also likely um, and hopefully uh, expand the impact of the software and, and of your own work and help you in your career. 
So looking at software documentation from a slightly different angle, uh, there are some other aspects that I'd like to mention. Like I said, it's crucial for the understanding of the software. So a well-documented software is easier to understand than badly documented software. But it's software documentation is also a productivity tool because documenting now will save you time later on in the process of developing your software. Documentation may also help you build a user base. Um, and the reason is the same. Uh, understandable software is easier to use and to pick up than badly documented software. Documentation may also, also actually be good for your career, uh, specifically if you make clear when and how to cite it. And if your software gets cited, then you may you know, be able to um, use this in, in, in an evaluation process of your work or if you're, if you're doing an interview for a job later on. And there is this uh, law that software documentation is really tedious and you may ask yourself why you really uh, want to do this, but it's actually uh, not as tedious as Laura may have it because there is good, good tooling available and there are some practices, some of which I'll hopefully, hopefully be able to show you uh, during the talk that you can use to make it less tedious. And finally, and I think this is perhaps the most important aspect of uh, software documentation, it is simply good scientific practice. Um, so when you write papers to document your research results, um, I think that you should also document your software, which may in fact also be a result of your research. Um, at this early stage, I'd like to ask if there are any pressing questions already. Um, let's see here. There was some, uh, there is an unfinished question. Keep going on. Someone is typing. <laughs> okay. I think I'll just continue and we can, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a break later on to, to ask for more questions. Right. So now before I go into the actual details of my talk, um, if you take away anything from this talk, then let it be the two following things. The first thing is think about documentation of your software before you actually start coding. And this doesn't mean that you have to create a long list of documents or UML diagrams or things like that. Um, but it can mean that you start with a lean structure, perhaps a simple readme document that can grow over time and that you can use to spawn off other formats of documentation, which I'll talk about later on. And the second thing is that you should think about why you want to document your software in a certain way. So think about your motivation for documenting your software. If you plan to remain the only user of your software, and for example, if you only use the software in, for your PhD or some other project, but you want to remember in the future why you have made certain decisions, then this may mean that you can you know, use code comments only or use semantic identifiers in your software, such as understandable function names, etc. But if you want to say receive academic credit for your software and be cited, then this may mean that you want to document citation information in a metadata file, such as a citation.cff file, um, which is the citation file format. If you want to be able to collaborate later on on the software with other people, then this may mean that you need to write contribution guidelines and developer documentation. So let's dive into the actual questions you should answer for yourself or for your team when you think about documentation before you start coding. See if we can make out some good practices here. So the five big questions that I'm going to cover are when to document, who to document for, what to document, how to document, and where to document. And the recommendation starting with when to document is very clear. Um, it is start documenting right now. Meaning when you write code, document it at the same time. This may sound very tedious and you know a lot of like a lot of work, but it doesn't have to be. Like I said, there is tooling available, which I'll talk about in a bit. But you should document now mainly because it is necessary, and that's because you'll have a mental model of the code you write in your head available, and that's available at the time when you write your code. But it may be gone, or you know, partly gone, or warped later on, or maybe even be wrong. So it's a matter of making a habit out of real-time documentation, so to speak. Uh, to help you do that, you can think of documentation as being part of the code itself, or perhaps of a co uh, change to the code you want to, to make at a certain time. Um, sorry, we'll talk about this later, but a defined development process can also help you with this. Uh, but to give you some practical examples, if you use version control, for example, you can make it a habit to make relevant documentation a necessary part of the revision you want to commit. So saying, if it's not documented, don't commit it. Um, if you use something like pull requests or merge requests, depending on the platform you use, you can 
include a check before you merge changes into the code base that all relevant documentation is there. Um, and these examples also show that when we say document now, now is actually relative. And um, what I think we would like to say is that it simply means that the documentation should be made in a timely fashion. And timely fashion in this case means document something before something is finished. And this something can be a change set or a task, a programming task. It can be a feature or a bug fix, or it can be uh, the publication of a whole piece of software. So if you look at it this way, documentation can also help you structure your work in a better way. If you think about documentation from the get-go, from the start, you can define self-contained work packages more easily. There is one um, consistent or perhaps extreme example of this, and that's called the tutorial-driven development process, which is something that Chris Woods from Bristol in the UK has written about. Um, and you'll find a link to um, a blog post about tutorial-driven development um, on the last slide. I can also paste it into the chat a bit later on. Now let's, let's look at who to document for. Um, one very clear suggestion is that you should always document for yourself or for your future self. Um, and that's for the reasons mentioned above. Your, the mental model of the code you're writing may be gone in a week or even 30 minutes, which is the case with me sometimes, or three months when you get back to the code and want to work on it. Um, and then you should also, of course, document for your target group. And who this target group is depends very much, again, on your motivation for document, documenting the software, which is something I've mentioned before. Um, to go through the groups very quickly, one group is clearly the users. And these users may be other researchers and therefore people who will cite your software. And this probably means that you should add, write at least some user documentation so they can start using the software. But you may also want to include uh, citation documentation, you know, leave them a citation file which clearly documents how to cite the software. Another group um, you may want to target with your documentation is your collaborators. And these people may be other developers or other roles in your team. And for them, you should definitely write documentation to enable them to do their work. This may be, you know, documentation on how to test or documentation on how to uh, format design documents. Um, Another point is that they should also document themselves, obviously, because they will know from their specific domain um, what to document in terms of, say, tests or design or anything, anything else that matters within the scope of the project. Um, if you write for your collaborators, then this probably means that you need to include in your documentation at least some contribution guidelines. Some people um, do this in a contrib contributing MD markdown file in their repository should probably also include the necessary developer and maintainer documentation, which helps people uh, continue developing the project. And then there are people who may evaluate your work, for example, in some sort of impact evaluation or in a software review process. And actually, this is something that's becoming more common. For example, if you submit your software to a software journal, such as the Journal of Open Source Software, also called JOS, or if you're asked to submit software that you've used for a paper, for example, and that software will also be reviewed and may get a certified stamp or something similar, uh, be included in the, in the publication on the uh, publisher's website. Um, evaluators may also be people, other people who evaluate your work. So perhaps your PI will want um, updates and information about your software project. Um, and all this may mean that you may want to include other things in your documentation, such as impact metrics, quality metrics, you know, the results of static code analyses. Um, you may want to provide usage reports, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, um, the last target group is funders. And funders may want something completely different in terms of documentation and information. They may want reports, but also abstracted information about your software or a software publication. Uh, for example, to determine the role that uh, the software has played in achieving the project of uh, the, the aims of your project that they have funded. As a general remark, um, try to anticipate the level of experience of the audience, because this will influence then the level of detail you want to document on, and whether you want to write, you know, large bulks of text, or if perhaps uh, some short comments or a bullet list uh, may suffice. If you're not sure what the level of experience of your audience is, then try to write as simple as possible, 
explain what may not be clear, what may not be clear to uh, the, the person sitting next to you, maybe ask them, avoid abbreviations, avoid jargon, etc. And keep in mind that the audience may actually change over time. So try to write understandably from the start, don't use irony, don't use you know, swear words and comments, etc., etc. And then what to document, again, really depends on the target audience, but also on your motivation on what you want to achieve. So for example, code documentation is definitely necessary to have for yourself, like I said, and for any collaborators, but it may also be useful to users and evaluate this, especially when they want to look at your code in detail later on. Um, project documentation is surely necessary if you address evaluators or funders, but it may also actually be useful to users, for example, if they want to understand the context in which a software has been created or the use cases which, which it can be used for, or even collaborators to assess whether they want to contribute to the software if they're coming from the outside of your project. And to give some examples of the different types of documentation that I've mentioned here, um, code documentation includes something like semantic identifiers, so function names, uh, names of variables, etc., but also code comments, the API docs you write into your code, any engineering uh, information you have, release engineering uh, documentation, dependencies, etc., requirements um, for running your software. And maintenance documentation is um, kind of the bridge towards user documentation and developer documentation. It uh, lists how to build, includes how to build, how to release your software, how to review the code, if that's a part of your process, and also how to publish the software. User documentation is probably something you are most likely um, familiar with. This is basically how to, you know, how to get the software, how to download it, how to install it, how to run it, the parameters that your software provides, the data model it uses, et cetera. But also, and that's very important, the license under which users can actually use your software. Developer documentation covers everything uh, from how to contribute to your software, but also things that may not be um, written into documents such as contribution templates for issues or for pull or merge requests. And I've also mentioned metadata before. So if you want to uh, document what your software is, then you can use a software metadata file, for example, in the code meta scheme, uh, schema, um, which can be um, written into a JSON LD file, which lives in your repository. If you want your software to be cited later on, then you can use the citation file format and write a simple YAML file that people who come to your repository can read and extract the citation information from, but which can also be used later on by um, archives or by indexers uh, to display the correct citation metadata. You may want to um, include also in the documentation references for your software, which means dependencies, for example, or papers you've used to, um, you know, which describe algorithms you've in implemented in your software. And finally, the probably most high level documentation is project documentation, which gives you the rationale for implementing the software, an overview of who's worked on the software, a governance document or structure and community documents such as um, you know, the code of conduct and uh, contact details. Now, as for how to document, I just want to mention that there are many different options. And generally, how you document will again depend on who you document for and your motivation for doing so. So I just want to briefly mention three different genres of documentation you may want to look into. And these are conceptual documentation, which usually represents higher level views of the software. And this includes you know, project documentation, design specification, et cetera. There is conceptual hands-on documentation, which includes user guides, tutorials, and templates uh, for things such as issues or pull requests. And hands-on documentation enables people to do something with your software. And reference documentation is, um, I guess, the genre, the genre of documentation uh, developers think mostly about, and that's API docs, code comments. This may include tests and metadata as well. And this type of documentation basically answers the questions, what has been done and how and why something has been done in the software. Um, I'd like to also give you some more practical hints for how you can get started. Um, I think that the absolute minimum you should do to document your software is create a readme file, and that should live at the root of your project. And you can expand the readme file, I've mentioned this before, while you work. So if you find that your readme is getting too complex or too large, 
this may be an indication that you should try to think about other forms for some parts of the documentation you now have in your readme and then to extract these parts away from the readme and create a separate user guide for example or a project website to explain the context in more detail or a code of conduct document that also lives in your repository and then the other thing is try to write self-documenting code and that is break up your code in, into meaningful sections for example into functions and these are really just the, you know the best practices you may have heard about use descriptive names for variables for functions for types uh, write comments whenever necessary and a second point to make is the documentation sources should always be human readable even if they're meant to be transformed into something else later on for example into a website um, or into a pdf or something um, simple markup language exists, and they can help with that. Um, some of the examples are markdown um, or restructured text, um, and they can help you uh, keep the documentation sources human readable. And also this is important because there may be cases where only the sources for your software survive. So no, so no binary artifacts, for example, no fancy websites that render your documentation very nicely. And people that find these sources should still be able to read the documentation and make sense of it. Uh, also, if you archive your software, say to Zenodo or to Software Heritage, then people will still be able to access the, the documentation. And perhaps even you know, something, something nicely, some nicely rendered version can uh, later on perhaps still be built out of it. A third point is that um, make documentation machine readable or even machine actionable when it's useful or necessary even. This is definitely the case for unit tests. If you use your tests for documentation, these should have gone, you know, of course be runnable and then pass ideally. Um, it's also the case for metadata files, which contain information about your software, um, but also for texture documentation from which you can build user-friendly artifacts such as websites, et cetera. And finally, um, there is a lot of technology and tooling available for documentation. Try to make use of it. Sometimes it's not easy to find those tools, um, but there are some de facto standard tools for say some uh, programming languages like uh, Python or Java. Um, try to find out about these and try to make use of them. Um, so available technology and tooling that will help you get your documentation tasks done are, like I said, simple markup languages like restructured text or markdown. Um, like I said, they're human readable, but they can also be used to create something more user-friendly like a website. And you can, for example, use a static site generator to do this. There are many of them out there. Um, an example that's often used is Jekyll, hosted on GitHub pages, which um, renders Markdown to a website. There are things like Hugo or MD Book. And if you're interested in finding out which generators are useful for documentation, we've actually done a subjective comparison um, of some of these in one of my projects called Hexatomic, uh, which is linked to on the last slide for which I'll also share the link in the chat in a wee bit. Um, available technology also includes generators for automated, automated rendering of API docs. And examples for this are Sphinx doc in the Python world, or Java doc in, the, in Java. So if you write um, a specifically formatted comment for say a function in your code, then this can be extracted by the generator to produce a website which gives users a good overview of what's actually happening in terms of API in the code. It also includes static documentation analysis tools, and, and these may help you detect gaps in your documentation, for example. And one of these examples that's often used is Doxygen. Um, and in one of my projects, we use um, Check Style for Java, which is actually a tool for enforcing programming style, but it also detects missing documentation. So these were some examples of uh, how, you, how you can get started with uh, documenting in practice. And finally, uh, some remarks on where to document. And the answer to the question where to document is actually very clear. Uh, documentation sources should always live where the source code lives. So this means uh, it, can, it should be in the same directory on your hard drive if you don't version control, which you should, of course or it can be in the same repository you use to version control your software. Always include the documentation sources alongside with the software. This is important uh, for a number of reasons. So um, if you do this, you're able to make the connection between the code and the documentation. This is especially important for users who um, access your source code, perhaps in the, in, in, the, in the source code form, in a repository, and 
if you keep documentation source code together, they'll be able to access both at the same time. Uh, it, it'll also help you to keep documentation and code in sync. If you work in one directory rather than two or many places, then it's easier for you to write documentation while you write your code. It's important uh, to keep the two together to archive the documentation later on. So if you archive the documentation with a source code, for example, like I said, on Zenodo or Software Heritage, uh, people can access them together again, even if the original version controlled uh, project has gone away. Um, if you keep the two together, it also, also makes it easy to use continuous integration tools to build documentation artifacts like websites, like you know, with static site generators, like API docs. Uh, and test your documentation together with running CI for your software, continuous integration. Um, keeping the two together also makes sure that whoever can access the software can also access the doc documentation, like I said. Um, this is clearly the case for open source uh, projects where, which are hosted online and um, accessible to the public. But it's also true for restricted access projects where you cannot share the software source code or documentation with anyone. And if you keep the two together, this will prevent kind of sp spilling secrets uh, to the public where they shouldn't be. Um, I should mention that some documentation can also live not only in text files or files that go in the same uh, directory or version control um, repository like the source code, but they may also live in project management tools, something like Kanban boards or issue trackers, bug trackers, uh, merge requests, pull requests, etc. Ideally, these are in the same place, again, as the source code and platforms like GitHub and GitLab or Bitbucket make this really easy. Ideally, um, and this is just um, a final remark on this, all documentation should form a graph. That is, all documentation should be able uh, to be referenced from any place within any other part of the documentation. And this can be done you know, just by using URLs to link to other parts of the documentation. So your project documentation should link to your user documentation, et cetera, et cetera. So at this uh, point, I'd like to leave you with this preliminary conclusion. And before I hand over to Sorrel, who will then make the connection between documentation and software process, I'd like to ask now again, if there are any questions that I can answer, could answer now. There are a few, and there is a very long question here. Uh, the first one, actually, Stefan, let's see. Can you detail some impact to metrics you touched upon as it relates to funding? Yes. So ideally, you will have documented um, how people can cite your software, for example. And if you do so, and people do actually cite your software and the software reference, uh, the reference to the software is counted on the website of the publisher, for example, this is something that you can link through from your software documentation. Um, you could also manually kind of, if you know about them, write a list, write down a list of papers um, which detail um, how your software has been used in, in practice and research, research practice. Or you can have a look at the more obvious metrics on version control platforms such as GitHub. You know, th there are stars, there are downloads. You should also make sure that you take all these impact metrics with a pinch of salt because they may mean completely different things to what you think they do. Um, but again, some, some uh, people, some evaluators, for example, your PI may be really keen on having a high number of GitHub stars or it may have a real world effect if you have lots of citations to your software and can show that your software has been cited as software, not as a paper you write about the software in many different places. And this is something that will, you know, may actually impact your career later on. So this is, this is, these are some examples for impact metrics. Do we have time for more questions, Osni? Hello, Stefan. We we do have here still some questions. Would you like to give it to Sorel and get back to the questions later? Yes, yeah, sure. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Sorel then, please. Hello. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Osni. Um, bear with me a moment while I just share my screen. So hopefully everybody can now see my screen. Yes. Great. Thank you. 
And so Stefan has shared with you there some great advice and I can see more great advice appearing in the chat as well from our participants. Um, and hopefully you're feeling quite convinced by now about the benefits of good software documentation. Um, you may be feeling quite optimistic, um, enthusiastic maybe about um, starting to apply some of these um, good practices. Um, or you may be feeling a bit less than enthusiastic, um, you know, more things to do and more tools to learn and you don't have time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I want us to just pause for a moment and acknowledge our own motivations for doing or not doing the things that Stefan's just suggested. So we don't have to let these motivations become drivers. We can kind of notice them and still be able to make objective decisions that are right for us and right for our project. And two things that I believe can help us with that are having, first of all, a well-defined process and also a strong team. And I believe that these two things can help you to make objective decisions about documentation. Um, so in this part of the talk, I'm going to try to show you the connection between project management process and documentation. And I would, I would go so far as to argue that if you have no discernible process, which I'm sure doesn't apply to anybody here, but you may make the wrong decisions about what to document and when. So I'm just going to briefly introduce or reintroduce myself. Um, I'm Sorrel Harriet, as you know. Um, I became a fellow of the Software Sustainability, Sustainability Institute in 2019. Um, and while I've been an SSI fellow, I've been investigating how research software teams collaborate and how they evaluate their success. Um, and I've done this through lots of interviews. So I've conducted over 15 hours worth of interviews with academic developers and project managers on mainly large scale projects. And I've also tried to assess the relative success of the different projects. Um, and if you want to read more about this, I've recently published a blog on the, a post on the SSI website. Um, but one of the interesting ideas to have um, resulted from this research is the idea that research projects are kind of successful by default. Sorry, not research projects, research software projects are kind of successful by default. And there are various reasons why I think this, this is often the case. And some of these I'm gonna just mention briefly here. So first of all, securing funding um, requires a lot of upfront planning. So you're going through a lot of, um, you're taking, you're doing a lot of upfront work in the application process and not leaving an awful lot to chance. So it would take something quite catastrophic um, to happen to, um, to bring your research software project to its knees. Um, the other, another reason is that I think success is often defined at the project level um, and we don't typically spend a lot of time um, planning how we're actually going to implement the software. So planning out our execution strategy. Um, so we tend to judge success based on high level criteria such you know deliverables and publications and has all the project money being spent and all of that kind of stuff we're not really investing a lot of time and energy in looking at the development mental level um, and perhaps because of this there often aren't strong quality control mechanisms built in um, so often we're happy that something works i've actually been on research software projects and the project um, uh, principal investigator said, oh, I don't care what it looks like as long as it works, that kind of thing. Hopefully that doesn't apply to you, but, but um, I don't think that's that unusual in research software. And um, obviously I'm generalizing here a bit, but these are some things that I've observed through, through my research. So, this has prompted me to think about how we might evaluate research so software projects differently um, and, and whether this might reveal a slightly different side to the story. 
Um, because I think there are two kind of critical success factors that don't really get considered that much in relation to research software. And one of these is the capacity of the software to support future work, which I think Stefan's already touched upon. And something that obviously the Software Sustainability Institute is very concerned about. Um, so what often happens is that in successive rounds of funding, um, software essentially can get rewritten from scratch several times. There's not really much recycling that happens. Um, and that's obviously wasteful. So, so this, is, this is an area that, that um, documentation can actually help support with. Um, and then uh, also soft critical success factors. So things like how stressed out were you on this project and how much sleep did you lose? And obviously they're not things that you're typically going to write about in your in your proposal, but but you don't want to go over budget there either um, for, your, for your own sake. And um, so by changing our kind of definition of success for research software projects, I think that we could learn that project management and process deserve a bit more of our attention. And that includes the documentation side of things because documentation is inextricably bound to process. Um, and, and hopefully you kind of think so too, and that's why you're here today. Um, so how and when you document software is affected by your process and other things too, the resources available and the audience and the requirements of the documentation and all of that, as Stefan's already, already mentioned. Um, but to give you an example how it's affected by a process, um, if, if your process is more iterative and your, your kind of destination is less certain, then you're not likely to be producing lots of detailed upfront documentation. Whereas if your process is more waterfall-like, then, then it makes sense to document um, more early on. Um, so I'm now going to ask you a few questions. Um, you don't have to actually answer, but they're stimulative to give you some food for thought, um, which I hope may help you to see this relationship um, more clearly for yourselves. So I want you to take a moment or two to consider these questions and, and consider how easy they are for you to answer in relation to maybe your current projects. Um, and whether everyone in your team could also answer these questions, and if not, why not? So I'm just going to pause for just a moment to give you room for reflection. Okay, so, so I believe that knowing what to document and when means kind of being able to answer these kinds of questions within your team. Um, and to help you better appreciate this or to experience this for yourself, um, I'm going to now um, ask you uh, or present to you some contrasting examples. So I'm going to present you with four different scenarios in which research software um, might be developed. And I want you to ask yourself how these, how your approaches to documentation might differ in these different situations. Um, and these, again, are to stimulate thought around the relationship between documentation and process. And there isn't any right or wrong answer here. Um, but maybe if you've got colleagues here in the webinar with you today, you could maybe use this as a basis for a discussion at a later date. So the first scenario I'm going to give you is the infrastructure project. So 
let's imagine that you're working on a critical infrastructure project that's likely to secure further funding and you're part of a large and distributed team of researchers in RSE, most of whom are on fixed term contracts. So you could think of this as, you know, this is a big, a big collaborative project. Maybe it's, it's uh, an EU funded project or the equivalent in the US. Um, and it, it needs to support um, other, other research um, long term, we'd assume. Um, but there's going to be a big team of people who are going to be in flux. So, I mean, what might be the priorities here or some topic uh, challenges or issues that might, might crop up in relation to documentation and collaboration in this, in this situation? I'll just give you a moment to reflect. So here you might also be thinking about what the interactions between team members or sub teams on the project might look like, what challenges there might be there and what forms of documentation might be important for, the, for this project to succeed. Okay, hopefully you've uh, that stimulated some thoughts. I'm going to move on to the next scenario. So quite different here. So you're working on an open source toolkit this time and you have funding for the next year, but you know that securing further funding is gonna be hard. And so the way around this is, is to be quite reliant on the open source community to keep the project alive. So let's assume this is a toolkit that's being used by researchers on other projects and um, yeah, it want, we want to keep it alive, but we just don't have any money for it basically. Um, what's gonna be really important here? Okay, I'm going to move to scenario three. So this is the user facing application. So this time you're in a small team on a user facing application whose main users are other researchers. So again, the software is important to support other research. Um, the project has funding for three years, but it may, we don't know about beyond that. It may struggle to receive uh, further funding. And, and all your team members are on fixed term contracts or they're PhD students. So we'll assume that the, the team's gonna change. Um, so again, what, what might be important here? <laughs> 
And then finally, um, this is probably one that we can all relate to, or many of us can relate to. Um, you're a PhD student writing scripts to perform simulations, let's say, um, and you're mainly working on your own. Um, but your hope is that your PhD project may form the basis of future work. That's the dream. Um, but we don't know for certain it could end up in the, you know, it could just fall by the wayside equally. So um, what, what might you be thinking about here in relation to documentation? Okay, um, so in each of the scenarios that you've just been presented with, I'd imagine that your answers would be quite different um, concerning documentation. Um, and that's because each project has its own set of aims and priorities and each team is different as well and has different processes. So there isn't, there isn't a sim simple answer, there isn't a one size fits all. Um, and so you have to become empowered to make your own decisions about what's right for you and what's right for the project. Um, and that might be quite difficult to do, especially if it's not something you've thought about before. Um, but there are some general rules that we can follow, um, some of which Stefan's touched upon already. And I'm gonna leave you with my sort of top three um, before we finish today. But before I do that, um, I'm just I'm just going to um, briefly touch upon something that Osni actually asked me about in the rehearsal for this talk. Um, so his question was was about budgeting. Um, how do we know how much time to set aside for documenting software within a project process? Um, and again, I don't think there's a simple or a single answer to this one either. I but I do think it's important to have a plan and a budget for your documentation. So by budget, I mean budget in time, budget in people. Um, we all know that uh, time estimation for software development is a notoriously difficult thing to do. Um, and I think that's perhaps even more so for researchers who we don't typically, typically get the opportunity to repeat the same or similar things day in, day out, to the extent that we can actually make very accurate estimations about time. Um, and we may also fall into the trap of being wildly over optimistic at times as well, um, perhaps because the money isn't really there to budget realistically for, for how long things are going to take. Um, but also because we're constantly context switching and that also adds another, it makes it even more challenging to be, to be accurate. Um, so, so I have a few tips related to this and, and the first tip is to be as realistic as possible, um, which is hard, but try to be realistic and try to eliminate waste where possible. So if you don't actually have a lot of time set aside for documentation or it, it's unclear how important this is going to be in the future, let's say, um, maybe it's better to take a leaner approach and to, to, to do a bit less, but to do it consistently. Um, and another tip would be to refer to standards um, around um, time estimation for technical documentation. Um, 
mainly if you know that your documentation is going to include user documentation, because there are actually methods for time estimating um, available already. Um, and there's even some sort of precise, you know, calculations you can do to try to estimate the time that's required for your for your documentation. Um, but again, that's probably only that's probably overkill for most people. But if you're writing a proposal for something substantial that's going to include lots of user documentation, then maybe it's something to look into. And I've just uh, put a uh, pointer to the to the relevant standards there. So finally, then, before I finish and take questions, um, I just want to leave you with my sort of three top tips for documentation. Um, which can start as a can serve as a starting point, especially if you're mm, a bit not sure where to start, then you could just start with these things. Um, so first of all, um, this is something that Stefan's already mentioned, actually, make your code self documenting. I think that's probably the most important thing that any of us can do um, to to write our code um, in a way that makes it easy for other, other developers to understand um, and you know, there are various tricks for this. Um, um, one that I don't think he mentioned, uh, the one at the bottom here on the slide, if, if you are actually working on a large code base in a dynamically typed language, then you might consider using a type checker. And um, the, the, the fewer errors or possible sources for error or confusion within a code base, um, the better really and the easier it's going to be for other developers to understand and run at a later date. Um, secondly, document mindfully. So this is the idea that you should apply the tools and, and best practices around documentation mindfully. So think about whether or not this is actually necessary for your project. What are the benefits going to be? What are the risks going to be? Um, is there any other way that this could be communicated within your team? So does it have to be through documentation or, or could you just could you just have a chat? You know, it, 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 it's sort of being being thoughtful about it um, and not necessarily following sort of not following best practices blindly. And then finally, document consistently. I think this is really important. So who else needs to be on board with this? I think this, this is one of the questions that cropped up in, in the chat earlier. Um, I think if you're working collaboratively, then you all within your team need to agree and apply um, whatever techniques you're, or approaches you're adopting. You need to do that consistently because there's no point if one person does everything wonderfully, but the rest of the team doesn't. So it might be best to you know, be less ambitious, but to have everybody on board and doing it consistently. Um, and one of the ways to ensure consistently is to have code review. So that's probably something that you will do anyway. Um, and, and it's really important to, to maintain that consistency and quality and, and focused effort. Um, so those are my three golden rules. Um, and so that brings me to the end of, um, of, of my part of the talk. Um, so thank you for, for your attention and I hope you found something useful from it. Um, and just before I take questions, um, I would just like to point out some resources that Stefan and I have, um, have pulled out for you, which you might find interesting or useful. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you and well done for being here. I know how difficult it is for many of us to actually be here to attend a webinar. Um, okay, so is, is there any questions, Osni? Thank you, Sorel. Uh, first, yeah, so there, there, I think there was a, we will have, a, there was a good discussion in the chat and I think we will have later to consolidate what is in the Q&A and, uh, and in the chat because I think some of the questions have already been answered in the chat by uh, uh, Stefan. So what I have done here, I just, I changed the, 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 the settings here. So if people would like, the participants would like to unmute themselves, they can ask questions directly without typing here. So if, uh, if there is anyone in the audience who uh, would like to unmute, 
and ask questions, please. You can do it now. So meanwhile, while we wait for people or type in the Q&A or the chat and then, uh, so we uh, when we uh, wait uh, to see if there are more questions, I'll take the opportunity to thank you all for participating. Uh, if you have a few minutes or a minute to give us some feedback, please uh, do it. So our sponsors like, you know, to know how uh, we have been doing with the series. So the slides and the recording will be, actually the slides are already avail uh, available at this address uh, there. So the next webinar in the series is gonna be on the 10th, but March, an overview of the Raja portability suite and it's going to be presented by Arturo Vargas, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, you can uh, register for that event already if you are interested. Uh, so let me go back here again to the participants to see if there is anyone who would like to uh, think in the chat here. Uh, there is one person saying that that was an interesting discussion. Thank you for the for the comment. Um, so the uh, I'm gonna so I'm gonna work. So Stefan and Sorel and I will go again so just to go through the Q and A and the chat and consolidate this discussion that's in there. Uh, um, any further questions from the audience? Hi, uh, this is Dmitry Piekurovsky. <clears throat> Hi, Dmitry. Um, yeah, please. Also, go ahead, please. But uh, my question was. And maybe I missed it. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, could you compare different uh, document generators like Doxygen, Read the Docs, um, whatever other? Well, uh, how do they compare with each other? Sorel, would you like me to try and answer this question? Um, yes, please go ahead. Okay. So, in my experience, um, there isn't a good way to uh, compare things in this case because. A lot depends on which programming language, language you're using, which framework we're using, etc. Um, we have done in a project I'm working on a comparison of static site generators, which are the generic tools for publishing um, markdown sources or uh, RST sources to to a website. Um, what we've also done in Java for the Java world and all that is that we've uh, taken a tool, like I said, um, Checkster, which is actually meant for um, checking your programming style and made that to also check the documentation. Um, I think there isn't a, a good answer here, uh, apart from saying that, have a look at the, at the, um, at the ecosystem of the of the language and see whether you can find something there. A lot of the tools I think uh, that I know of um, do the same thing in many different ways. Um, I've used Doxygen before, but I thought thought it was very tedious because you had to you know, check a lot of XML and um, configure, etc. So we just resorted to using a CI plugin for check style which checks uh, documentation and finds gaps and does, does nothing more. Hope this helps at least a bit. So I guess the short answer is uh, it depends. Thank you for the question, Dimitri. Any other further questions for Stefan or Sorel? If no further questions, thank you very much again, Stefan. And Sorel, and uh, I think we got a good crowd today. Hope to see uh, to see folks next month. Thank you again. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.